Tonight, we're excited to share with you stories of how the home furnishings and bedding industries have played such a crucial role in funding the most successful innovations and clinical trials led by Dr. Daniel Von Hoff and his team at TGen. TGen's alliance last year with California's City of Hope, which is very powerful, is already paying dividends in the form of new research and advancing precision medicine to help our patients. Through, our continued, uh, through your continued support of the Sina Magowitz Foundation, we're changing outcomes for pancreatic cancer. There's a reason that there are growing numbers of patients who, against all odds, are living longer and healthier lives. And that reason is you, each and every one of you in this room. We thank you. Your support enables TGen and Dr. Von Hoff to pursue some of the world's most innovative pancreatic cancer treatments. The nation's current standard of care treatment for advanced pancreatic cancer approved by the FDA was headed by Dr. Von Hoff and funded in part by all of us here through the Sina Magowitz Foundation. In fact, your steadfast support of Dr. Von Hoff has led in recent years to three of the nation's last four clinical trials that have succeeded in extending survival of patients with advanced pancreatic cancer. Our keynote speaker is determined to make more improvements in patient, pair, in patient care. He's here tonight to report on the remarkable progress being made in addressing the disease. Besides his work as TGen's distinguished professor and physician in chief, Dr. Von Hoff also is professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic, senior consultant clinical investigator at City of Hope, clinical professor of medicine at the University of Arizona, and chief scientific officer at US Oncology and at the Honor Health Research Institute. Please join me in welcoming the smartest man, not only in the room, but in the world, <laughs> Dr. Daniel Von Hoff. Thank you. I think I'd be better off just stopping right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Nice you. Yeah. <laughs> Diamondbacks. <laughs> well, I say good evening, everyone. But before I begin, I want you to have, if you want to have a prolonged conversation here in Boston, just ask my wife, Anne, about our nine grandchildren. That's the newest one, Stephen Paul. And Roger, we need a smaller shirt for that one. <laughs> but they all got the Cena Magowitz Foundation shirts. That's our family picture every year. <laughs> well, everyone tonight here has the same mission, to cure pancreatic cancer. And we can do it by new therapies for those who have it, by early detection, and eventually, hopefully, prevention. But our memories this weekend run deep. We lost Phil Zabliski and Kathy, we are so glad to have you here. We know how hard it is. Maybe we don't know, but thank you for being here. And Dr. Jill Pekacek, you know, they fought together. They pioneered some of the clinical trials we'll be discussing tonight. So let's celebrate their courage tonight. Now, as a reminder, I received this after Jill had passed away on Jill's birthday. And she says, uh, this is my new address, heaven. I'm not sure who sent that, but I wouldn't put it past Jill to have sent it from that location. For I know the plans I have you declared, the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And I promised that I would say that verse tonight. And at a prior Cena Magowitz Golf Classic in Arizona, because we feel the weight of the things that need to be done, there was a daughter of someone here in the audience of a very special man, and she came up, she's an intensive care unit nurse of a pediatric, and she said, please keep my daddy alive. He's the only daddy I have. And some of you might recognize him, maybe not in the hospital bed, but off to the right. Is that 35 years of marriage? 39 years of age. So, congratulations.
We want to honor all of you here tonight for your gifts, but the number one thing that we can do to honor is, besides the science and other things, is to give really good, compassionate care. That comes first, no matter what. And we emphasize a lot of the science, but that compassionate care, I think everybody realizes, means the most. So your support makes that happen. We're here tonight to work together to give others a hope in a future. And I think Derek and Mark, we have a hell of a highly motivated team here, no question about it. We got a lot of pictures from the past, a uh, lot of incredible contributions from so many, even with wearing funny pants. <laughs> and it takes a crazy amount of work to put this on. And I just want to thank Roger, Liz, and so many uh, for putting this on. So a round of applause, please. But I think Naval Special Warfare Operator James Hatch, who we've had the privilege to meet, said it best in his new book. He says, in gunfights, what made us potent was not the gear, guns, and macho nonsense. It was drive, professionalism, and a love for each other. The same traits I saw in the segment of society that saved my life and repaired my spirit after I was shot. James, we really appreciate that. And I hope everybody here, that love for each other comes through day after day after day because of this kind of event tonight. And I, th I think our survivors here realize that. It's the most important thing we can do. We also have, uh, as you've heard, a special board, which may not be my favorite board to answer to. <laughs> as you can see, these are very tough executives, executrixes. That, uh, it's a very tough board. I say we thank you, although sometimes before I have to present, I'm not sure that's my feeling. Now, what I'll be presenting tonight is a team effort. You have our two, two of our incredible nurses, Joyce and Lana here, Urkut Borazansi, Ayung Han. Stand up. For them. Oh, no. I actually wanted them to stand, but thank you. <laughs> well, I have four take-home messages tonight, and it won't be long. Um, number one is we are making progress for patients with stage four pancreatic cancer. You know, the latest statistics are actually 2000 to 2015, and they don't, uh, by any means, reflect some of the advances. It's better than that. And this year, we're going to be working very hard with your support uh, to make cold pancreas cancer hot again. You'll hear briefly about that. Point number two, if you have always have chemotherapy after your surgery, it makes an incredible increase in survival. Point number three, there are now some subsets of patients with pancreas cancer you can do by genetic profiling that can live a very long time because they have special mutations and very, very high response rates to simple therapy, even taking things by mouth. And number four, there are some very promising results in early detection, maybe even catch it eight years ahead of time. So the first message, what's our progress against stage four disease? By using the dollars that uh, people in this room uh, generate, we are able to obtain pilot data with 10 to 25 patients. We want to see if something gives a response, and that means a shrinkage. And on, bottom, on the bottom there for you, I showed you uh, shrinkage. Kind of hard to see, I guess, but that's all tumor in the liver. And uh, here it goes away after therapy. And that's what we mean by tumor shrinkage, the tumor going away. We actually use that pilot information to apply for major grants from the National Cancer Institute, from Pharma, and Stand Up to Cancer. And by our latest estimates, what the dollars generated here has leveraged about $172 million against the disease. It's really quite dramatic. You have to be successful getting the grants. You can't do it without pilot information. And what I mean by response here is that if you can shrink the tumor, you can improve patient survival. This is where we currently are for driving to 100%. And I show everything from the very early days and the Cena 1, and we say Cena 1, Cena 2, Cena 3, mattress firm, Cena 4, got a Cena 5. And this is the major response rate, in other words, shrinkage of the tumor. And you can see here the latest uh, regimen we have is 86% of patients' tumors shrinking. 
So we have something really substantial to build on, because if you look at the back, <laughs> if you look at where you begun, there was zero that did that, and many of my colleagues here tonight remember that. Gemcitabine was about 5%. So you can see there's been pretty darn good progress, not 100% not yet, but getting there. But one-year survivorship, and I show Gail Jamison and Urquhart Borazansi, who have the latest therapy. You can see now that this year, this has been up to 65%, and you heard it was 25% or so. It was actually 18% before. So this is where we are right now, 65%. And the good news is if you, if you make it that first year, then you have a much better chance of getting two, three, four, five, and some people here tonight, 10, 11, 12 years. So very, very important to get that one-year survivorship. I think we're going to surpass this. But this is the first time this has ever been shown in public. This is the two-year survivor rates now for regimens. This has never been reported by four, by before, but we're very sure of this now, that in the SENA 3, as you can see, for the first time, and by the way, there were no two-year survivorships before. This is stage four pancreatic cancer. It's 40%. And again, if you make it to two years, you're going to make it longer and longer and longer. You've got to be alive to get the next breakthrough. So this is very good, but not good enough. But it's because of your support. But there's also other news for patients with advanced stage four pancreas cancer. And actually over at table 13 are some of the doctors who are responsible for this, and we thank them. 45% improvement in average survival, even if a person progresses on one of these regimens. 45% uh, improvement. What this proved is that even if the first thing does not work, you can actually have something that works at the second, third, fourth regimen. And there are many other agents in the wings we don't have time to go, go through tonight. So we have lots of options if the first therapy doesn't help or helps for a while. So take home message number one, we have progress, thanks to you, against stage four pancreatic cancer. We need to build on that progress to increase the response rate to 100%. That's what we're after. Our strategy to try to do that, and this is really the big topic for tonight and where we're asking for the help, is making cold pancreas cancer hot again. Every person's immune system in here, even with pancreas cancer, is actually normal. We're trying to coax the person's immune system now into recognizing that pancreas cancer, which has been growing about 25 years already. People don't realize it takes about 25 years to show itself. It's a foreign invader, but actually, it's figured out ways to evade our own immune system. And, and for some reason, it says, don't penetrate us uh, and, and don't destroy us. This is, of course, the new field of immuno-oncology. Everyone walks in and said, I want what Jimmy Carter got. Okay? And that are these agents that take out, it's an antibody that takes out these signals, these do not eat me signals, and there's no question it works very well in many tumor types. But what people don't realize is in melanoma and in kidney cancer, where they work the best, is that once in a while, if you took out a person's kidney cancer, even though they had disease all over the place, it went away. Which meant the immune system was ready to go, but it was just too much tumor to overcome. But what happens in patients with pancreas cancer? I mean, this, these are so effective. You see them on the Super Bowl, and there's no question these antibodies to the do not eat me molecules, and there are many in development, they work against melanoma and lung cancer and Hodgkin's disease, 100% response rate in Hodgkin's disease, cervix cancer, stomach cancer, bladder cancer, anywhere between 16 and 100% of the time, but it's never been a response in a person with pancreas cancer. Hundreds of patients tried, never. Why? Because in these tumors, there are no killer T cells. Now, I'm not sure this is exactly what the cell looks like, but when a virus comes and infects one, our cells, the T killer T cells goes and kills it. Cancer cells, it will kill. If it's bacteria infection, it'll kill. And the killer T cells terminate cancer cells. This is a real picture of a killer T cell putting tentacles into this, can this pancreas cancer, actually, uh, tumor cell. And these killer T cells can kill 50,000 cells Kill, pancreas can one, 50,000 in a day. It goes in, injects, reprint, injects, injects, injects. So we got to have these killer T cells into the pancreas cancer. 
It's like a Boston police officer keeping them out. We just don't know why. We don't know why. These killer T cells, of course, if they're in a tumor, I can tell you that other tumor types where these do not even work, these tumors are hot. They're inflamed. They already got an infection like going. Killer T cells actually see it and they destroy. But pancreas cancer is cold and it's actually ignored. The question is, what is it doing? Is it the scar that's keeping them out physically? Are there do not eat me signals from the pancreas cancer? And a lot of people feel even from the scar. And maybe other reasons, uh, Urquhart would say, well, maybe it's low pH or low oxygen in the tumor, which is true. Maybe the killer T cells don't work so well in that environment. We don't know. We're trying to traffic. We call it trafficking. That's why we put the Boston cop in there. Those killer T cells of the patient's tumor. And, and Urquhart has the great uh, start on this. He's put together the Tejan Grand Slam, the baseball theme, of course, the Tejan Triple, and high doses of uh, vitamin D and nivolumab. Using chemotherapy to decrease the scar, maybe destroy the cancer, sensitize it, and he's got that 86% response rate. And we're expanding that number of patients. We just got good news that we can do another 10 patients. Number two, uh, maybe we could try to inject things directly into the tumor. Intratumor vaccination, it's called, to make tumors hot again. And we have two leads. One is put a foreign piece of DNA in there so the body recognizes it, or even take a virus that's been somewhat paralyzed. And even though the injection is at one site, I'll show you the miracle that occurs in our animal models. This is work from the Stanford team and Dr. Cried brings back there. You can see here in this uh, model that you can inject this virus into this tumor, and believe it or not, this one goes away and there's 100% survival, 100%. That's not been seen before. It's training those killer T cells to not only see what's in one site, but others. And that's what we're working hard to do tonight, is to get the funding for that particular trial. We're very excited about that trial. Now, as you know, we have other studies that we're going. We call this the final assault. The idea is get a 100% response rate. If you get a 100% response rate, you'll affect survival. So we have one that's called the Orange Bowl study which Howard uh, Young has been working on. That's the triple versus very, very, very high doses of vitamin C, nothing that's been seen before, to increase free radicals and attract those killer T cells. We have another study called the prohibition regimen, which, be, believe it or not, is for, takes the drug antabuse, which stops alcoholics from drinking, because if they drink, they really get terrible nausea. And they seem to affect cancer stem cells. So we say thank you to Natalie Sabga because she was here last year and got that started. Many of you know of Natalie and multiple others. And I'll just show you that we're trying to train these T lymphocytes against a patient's tumor. Uh, Dr. Hidalgo, maybe he's back there somewhere. That's the last man here. He wants to take tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. There are some in there, a few. Could we train them up? Could we expand them? Could we make them angry again? Because there are a few in some patients' tumors. By the way, if you have them there, you have a better prognosis, even if there are a few there. So we have these regimens, no patients on trial, but these really very solid ideas. The goals for the final assault are, of course, to get the best five ideas going in the next two and a half years. And we've taken working hard to get this going. We help bring the next generation of investigators. You can see very distinguished, uh, young, and seasoned investigators there. So we get these studies done more quickly, and very importantly, a little closer to people's homes. And we have others, I won't take your time, but we have these clinical trial sites that are set up because of Sina Magowitz tournament. We have many friends, even at Samsung Medical Center uh, in Seoul, South Korea. So people don't have to travel. So what's take home message number two? Always have chemotherapy after surgery for your pancreas cancer. I don't care what stage it is, always. It's called adjuvant, and people in the room are very familiar with adjuvant therapy here. It works in breast cancer, colon cancer, and other cancer. And when you use it a little earlier for stage four, you have major impact on improving survival. That's why the mortality of breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer has just plunged. It's much better survival. You always need to use something that's proven, though, in stage four disease, because it's incredibly more active early. And I just want to share this with you. This is a study 
493 operable patients. They all had operations when they walked in and said, we can operate on you. Some of them had positive margins. Many had lymph nodes. But they got the modified fulfirinox, which is a very uh, a common regimen, versus gemcitabine. And I just want to point out the bottom line. The overall survival uh, is, let's see if we can get the one I want to the overall survival here is 54 months versus 35. You say, well, that's, that's pretty good, but um, here's the interesting part. If you live the four years, you're very unlikely to ever have a recurrence. Very, very, very unlikely. So these patients probably are really cured, and that's why getting regimens very active against stage four can have a gigantic impact. Interesting question is, who funded this? Were there any governments funding it? No. It was writing to cure pancreas cancer across Canada and unicancer. And I put Roger's picture in here because the real thing that's made a difference against this disease, because that's a gigantic stride, is philanthropy. And that's where you're the leaders. You started it. And as a matter of fact, we can't wait because the CENO1, the NAB paclitaxel on gemcitabine, is in a huge clinical trial. It's finished, run by Dr. Margaret Tempero at UCSF is a gigantic study, 1,000 patients. We just can't wait to see what impact that has. Because if you get that kind of survival, then you're going to get cures. Take home message number two, always have chemotherapy. Tell your friends after surgery to prevent or greatly prolong. Even if the tumor is borderline resectable or inoperable, get on a protocol so you can get that therapy to shrink it down. It's going to have a major impact on survival. And we have to have things that work in stage four patients. What's take home message number three? You might recognize somebody in here, Gail. There are subsets of patients with pancreas cancer who can have dramatic and long lasting. People are not the same. We have folks here tonight, but you have to have your normal cells, which we call germline. So that's the genetics lesson tonight. Your normal cells, sperm and egg, germline. And your pancreas cancers, biopsy and molecularly profiled. Now just to show you this, patients whose tumors have BRCA, BRCA mutations, or PAL-B2, yes, people will get, uh, they'll get breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreas cancer, stomach cancer, prostate cancer. It's about 5%, but that's 2,300 patients a year with, with pancreas cancer. So if either they're germline, you know, they're born with it, or they're somatic when the tumor grows these things, develop these in cells, these mutations have spectacular responses to oral drugs, PARP inhibitors, platinum, that's IV, mitomycin C. There are people in the audience tonight who are great examples of this. And patients whose tumor have mismatch repair, yes, there will be about 1% of people who will respond like Jimmy Carter did. These patients have mismatch repair. They have repair problems, and that attracts the killer T cells. So that's the clue. So if we can make these tumors hot again, you can do it by having genetics, where you respond, or we hope some other ways. I want to show you we're constantly looking for these things because people can become resistant to the PARP inhibitors. And just to show you where we look, this is the Caribbean sea squirt. There's a new agent from that purple organism. That's why we did it. Lurbanectinin. So we're going to have the first clinical trial uh, for patients with BRCA1, BRCA2, PAL-B2, which begins in September. We're very proud to be able to get this first in person. Take home message number four. There's some promising results in early detection, which is now called cancer interception. Wrong sport, Derek. But... This is results from Dr. Borazansi's team, and, and Urquhart's done a great job uh, with your support getting this wonderful, uh, uh, really, resource available. He has looked at 183 individuals. And they've come in because maybe family history of some cancer. 183 individuals. He classified 53% as high risk, maybe two first-degree relatives with pancreas cancer, for example. And in those folks, he found one person with pancreas cancer. But look what else happened. He found people with melanoma, thyroid cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, 14% of people perfectly healthy, walk, excuse me, walking in off the street, they had an early cancer. So you're going to see these uh, early detection programs really proliferate. And it's family history, it's BRCA, it's genetics, 
and it's taken a good history, but think of the impact on that. 14% of people who walked in. Urquhart, you've done a great job doing this. And before I forget, Lana does all the work. <laughs> Not true, but they both do. Lana. <laughs> And Joyce takes the calls, Joyce takes the calls, that's for sure. Well, what have we done with this? Well, when you have preliminary data, now we're able to apply for a grant from the National Cancer Institute, right? It's an $8 million grant, and we put all these centers together, and uh, we now have, uh, we're part of eight throughout the United States. There's eight other centers, and we're looking for early markers. By putting eight together, if a hot lead comes as an early detection method, we can test it immediately in all those institutions. Now I want to show you, this is the group uh, that's been put together. Uh, we've met first in Arizona, thought it was the best place. <laughs> but here are the promising things in early detection, just be another couple minutes. Number one, we're walking in tonight, somebody said my blood sugar is now f abnormal. That's the number one thing you can watch for. So if a person has a new onset of diabetes, uh, it looks as though that that's, that's so common. But if it goes from 101, that's, that's, that's high, to 146 within a year, that's a danger signal. Must have MRI of the abdomen. That's the number one way to, er, to diagnose pancreas cancer right now, early detection. Yeah, due to the Stand Up to Cancer grant, we found a new factor called leukemia inhibitory factor. You think, well, how would that be? But that turns out that that's high in the blood for some reason in people with very early pancreas cancer. Very exciting new finding. And a great new finding is that these tumor cells actually bud off things we call exosomes, and they're packets. They're like, an, like part of an address code on each one of the tumor cells. We're going to use those to load them and get, tumor, and get drugs back in. But this, these are budding, budding off. I think this is the most promising, and I think this is why we got this new grant, because we're studying exosomes. Nobody has found them before. They're very tiny. There are trillions of them circulating in all of us tonight. Communication, cell to cell. Then two quick things, special textural imaging and digital biomarkers. And we need this because the way to save Phil's and Jill's and so many others is this early detection. We have an early detection imaging group with the City of Hope now. And I want to show you an example. This is a patient who developed pancreas cancer in 2016. Right there. That's the pancreas cancer. You look back to x-rays in 2008. He had an automobile accident, so he had a CAT scan. Nobody saw anything. That's a, that looks normal, except if you do a new technique called textural imaging, you go back and look. You can see by that dip in this signal, that pancreas cancer, we put a circle around so you can see it, was sitting there at that time, eight years before. We're very hopeful. That, that this is really going to be a special technique. Trying to adapt it now to MRIs so you don't have to have radiation, right? Because MRIs have no radiation. But this is very promising. Also, in working with City of Hope, we have, and I think if you hit it, she'll start showing around. You can see the pancreas is there, and the cancer is in green. The yellow is a normal part of the pancreas, and the aorta, red, of course, and paints it blue for you. The, the, it's amazing. You can see the details, and so if you're going to do surgery or you're going to say, I'm going to have chemotherapy to shrink it down, you'll be able to tell whether you got it away from the vessels. But also you can imagine adapting the textural imaging to this, those two together, because the first thing to become abnormal is cancer needs blood vessels. It's got to stay alive, and it recruits blood vessels, but they're not like normal. They're helter-skelter, and you can tell it with this kind of imaging, very powerful uh, new, new imaging, City of Hope. And finally, there are other ways for early detection. There's digital biomarkers. This is an incredible st study where they went back and looked at people, uh, their, their emails and trafficking on the web, and, and found out that they could diagnose 56% of people with pancreas cancer by looking at what they were looking at in the web two years before. You say, well, what, what, what were the abdominal pain, uh, blood clots, you know, some of the things that come with pancreas cancer. So, you know, people are starting to say, well, you're going to have to manage cyberchondria. But anything that calls attention to the early diagnosis is useful. So, Mark, we're going to get you busy for some noob spots on this. 
at the end now, so I'll repeat uh, the four take-home messages. My teachers, in fact, she wanted to flunk me, one room schoolhouse in Wisconsin. She said my handwriting was so bad, she made me repeat it and stay after school to repeat my handwriting, and you can see how much I improved. No, not too much. Four take-home messages. We're making progress against stage four pancreas cancer. We need to get the killer T cells in. We gotta do everything we can. That's what we wanna do with the funds tonight. Always have chemotherapy after pancreatic surgery. It delays recurrence and stops it entirely. There are molecular subsets. Please have, say to any friends, have your tumor profiled. There are some easy treatments that are incredibly effective. And number four, there really are some promising approaches in early detection. We need some work. We need your participation. We need normals. We need people with or without pancreas cancer. We need your help in that area. You know, I think back. Phil and Jill tried everything they possibly could to fight this disease. We know that. They fought like crazy. So um, together, let's keep fighting this disease. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. That's why we're all here tonight, and you can see the difference that we can all make. And it's not just this weekend, it's tonight, and, and you heard from Dan where it really is from the philanthropy. It's from what we're doing here on this evening, and it's everything that Roger's doing, Cena Magowitz Foundation is doing, so we can't thank him enough. Uh, with handwriting like that, he was destined to be a doctor, we know that. <laughs> I thought it was great, too, that we saw a couple of photos of Gail. Any of you that have worked with her, um, that have been cared by her, you know that she is the most wonderful person in the world. So let's hear it for Gail. But Dr. Von Hoff, it's inspiring. Um, you renew hope, and we can't thank you enough.